Hi, George. Hey, how's it going? Very good. You're the first one on of the group. I love You're the first one on from our group. The the threads and I've just been, you know, I haven't had time because of work and everything to um, access. So I'm just grateful to sit in and, and enjoy the and enjoy the ride. Cool. Well, we'll, we'll be reading the book. Um, you can follow along because I'll do a share screen so you'll be able to read along on the PDF version of the book that I have. And, um, and then we'll, as, you know, we'll discuss it as we're reading it. And as we have diagrams and pictures in the book, we'll review that as well. And then if you have any pictures of people that you want us to do face reading on, then we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll engage in that too. So it should be a hands-on approach to it. So it should be fun. It's been fun so far. I think right now we're on page 56 of the book, is it page 56? Awesome. Okay, we're on page, of 438 pages, we're on page 56. So you're pretty much catching it at the beginning. Nice, very cool. When did you take the face reading class with Dr. Uh, Snyder? Oh, I was, um, you know, I've been following him for some time. And then of course uh, we went to Vegas um, and uh, I've been, to hypno thoughts is my third one and so uh so i've just kind of uh been following along as much as i can and and learning as much as i can you know oh good nice very good very good i don't have my own practice i'm still kind of in the novice area but um you know i've always been fascinated and you know, with the mind and hypnosis and, and all that interesting stuff. So, you know, that's the goal is to kind of, uh, as David likes to say, uh, that special kind of stupid is helping other, others, other people out. I know. I, I don't like when he says that special type of stupid, but I kind of get what he means. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, he's I mean, you just have been to a sarcastic. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's uh, sarcasm, but it's, um, yeah, it is what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating field. And, you know, once you get into it, it seems like it's kind of a deep rabbit hole that it kind of goes on and on and on as you know, but uh, you just have to jump in and start, you know, use one of the methods and just start practicing it on people and, and uh, doing it. And then you're, you know, I've been pleasantly surprised with the results that I've been getting with people that I've been, I've been doing this with people all over the world over the last year. And it's, it's really surprising to me how, um, how well it works. So it just encourages me to, you know, to get more certifications with him and just actually, you know, study with him more. And um, Hello? Yeah. Oh, I think I lost you there, you're back. Yeah, it looks like your connection just dropped for a few seconds there. Okay. Yeah, so I, I I think we met briefly in Vegas. I don't know if you remember me at all. Yeah, I kind of do. Are you going to have just your icon uh, profile picture or are you going to put your video on? So I'm actually driving. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's how I was with an earlier Zoom call. Yeah, I remember yeah. you. So how have you been? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Good, good. Awesome. And are you doing these once a week or what? Yeah, so we're trying to do the Chinese face reading at least once a week, either a Tuesday or a Thursday night, where we come together and read the book, and mm -hmm. then just review the pictures and the diagrams, and then you know actually have pictures of individuals that we have either on our Facebook or on our personal computers, and then just see how much we can unravel and uh, you know discover you know what that person is based on what we're reading on their faces as we're doing the Chinese face reading. So. Um, right. Yeah, it's a pretty, it's a, it's been really, really fun. So it, that's awesome. You practice it every week, as you can imagine. Right. And that's what you've been doing is practicing it every week. Yeah. So we're practicing it every week. I, I'm just think, I was just thinking um, earlier today, I was thinking, Hey, I was just might be a good idea to just get on Facebook, do a Facebook live 
and see if anyone wants me to maybe read the faces of whoever it is that they might volunteer or just of anybody, you know, and mm -hmm. yeah, what kind of interest and what kind of um, feedback I'll get from people just to, just to get more practice in and, um, and uh, see where that goes. Uh, Cause I figure the more I practice, I mean, I just saw there was funny cause I was watching this gal on YouTube today. Mm -hmm. Who I'd never heard of. Her last name was Romano. I don't remember her first name. And the first Romano. Name, her last name was Romano. I don't remember. Okay. Her name. She's some sort of psychologist. And okay. As, as as soon as she started talking, and I, was, it's like now you can't look at people's faces without reading them. It seems, you know. Sure. And um, so as soon as she started talking, I thought, oh my gosh, this girl has a lot of fear. I could just see like it on her face and her chin and I could see the life lessons on her forehead and um and I thought wow it was just very telling I thought she must have my my impression was that she must have been at the hand of uh some sort of abusive type like repetitive abusive relationship type situation right and I thought oh my goodness it was like it was very uh um almost alarming to see how because she had a smile but I could see you know right on her face because of the lines I could see the fear in her chin and and whatnot so right. interesting so it just made me look at the rest of her face she's not very old yeah um, I really don't know how old she is but I don't know maybe she's is it a little has it become distracting to you when you're actually having a conversation that you can see things that they don't that they're not aware of or that that you know um, no, not really, because um, one of the, my motivators for taking the face reading class was that I would have intuitive, I had intuitive hits where I would see things on people's faces and I would, I would know them, but I didn't really know how I knew them. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I wonder if this person knows about, you know, X, Y, Z. And so in taking the face reading, I wanted to be able to confirm what I was intuitively picking up. Right, right. Thing. And so once I took the face reading, then it was a nice confirmation where stuff that I would see, it's like, oh yeah, it's like, I see the confirmation on their face and other things that I, I have no idea about that with face reading now, it's more obvious. So, right, right. So it's not really a, it's not really a distraction, but I got to tell you now with all the whole thing with the politics and the elections and so forth, it's like, oh my gosh, everything you see on these politicians' faces, it um, makes it makes it kind of funny and fun, to be honest with you. It's like, I wonder right. if the public knows all this, you know? Yeah, and you have you seen those um, those videos? And by the way, I apologize if I'm obviously not looking at the camera because I have to look at the road. But yeah, no, okay. when I when I when I'm at stops, obviously I'll I'll uh, yeah. I'll turn. But um, so. Have you uh, watched any of those uh, from Chase Hughes, uh, those videos of he could tell like a liar or he'll he'll look at like celebrities and stuff and pick off based on their emotions and, and how they respond to things like their no, but body I'd language? Love, where did you see that? I would love to see that. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll uh, add it on the WhatsApp as a link, but he has this, um, um, this site where he has a bunch of these sort of like celebrity, um, you know, what, I don't know how you would call them as far as like body language experts and military experts and things like that. So they're really, really interesting. Um, I'll have to send you the link. It's really cool. Yeah, I want to see that. I haven't, I'm a, I, after HypnoThoughts, I, I got connected to him uh, to be, yeah. on, you know, be on Facebook as friends. But I really haven't yeah. seen, I can't say that I've seen much that he's done on there since then. Uh, so I'm curious right. to see where you saw that video. I'd love to watch that video and kind of get more versed. Because I, I, other than the one class that I took while I was at HypnoThoughts, I don't really have any other, um, anything else to, you know, judge how good he is other than Dr. David really promotes him quite a bit and talks a lot about him. And then I have one of right. those books that I have still to read. Um, and Did so- Did you get the ellipsis manual? Yeah, that's exactly the one that I have. Yeah. Oh, good. And, you know, it's, it's pretty technical. Um, have you had a chance to read through it? Not yet. I'm just, I, ha I've, I read like four or five books at a time, so I haven't gotten to that one. I have to get started. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 
it's very interesting because, uh, and I haven't read the whole thing through, but um, it's very interesting because he has all these like diagrams and key codes for every single type of expression. And um, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Interesting. So. Yeah, I'd like, yeah. To, I'd like to obviously read his book, but I also want to, um, I'd like to watch some of his videos where you see him actually deconstruct and kind of analyze uh, people, you know, especially with celebrities, because you have their public persona. And there's obviously certain things, right. that, you know, I think in our group, because we are in, you know, hypnotists, and we're, you know, neurosomatic specialists and regression therapists and doctors and uh, right. and all sorts of people that are in this field. Um, you, so we have, a, I think, a heightened sense of uh, sensitivity and a proclivity to be able to pick up different body cues that perhaps the general population may perhaps may not um, be quite as tuned into. Yes. But I think, um, yeah, I think those things are very telling. So I think it'd be really interesting to take a look at that. Um, are you familiar yeah. with yeah, from his the Light of Me series that um, that was that's on Netflix. Yeah, it's unfortunately it's not on there anymore, right? Or is it back? I don't know. I saw it a few years back. I watched it like twice because I love the thing about the microfacial expressions and yeah, the, yeah. The um, and I I actually um, yeah I, I watched the series. And then uh, it ended up going uh, off of Netflix because I was going to buy the program, but I'm like, ah, I don't need to buy it because it's there on Netflix. And then I went to like almost like the last episode or last two episodes, and then it just ended. And I went, oh, no. But I was really fascinated. I love the whole, um, the characters, the, the concept. It's really, really neat. Yeah, that was, that, that was a great series. I would watch it over again in a heartbeat because it was... I would too, and I think if we could buy it somewhere, I would I would be open to, to buying the whole um, episode. How many was there? Like two seasons or three seasons? I forgot what it was. I want to say there were like three seasons, maybe. Uh, I wonder yeah. if you get it on Amazon. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. It's super fascinating. Yeah, that was a great, very. I mean, it was very educational, especially when you had. Um, I can't remember the name of his character, but there was him, the doctor, and his partner. And then you had the natural, yeah. the Torres, who was a right. natural. And I thought, wow, yeah. it, was really, it was really fascinating. And to see how the gal, Torres, who was the natural, she was like right on par with the two PhDs. So I thought, that's so Yeah. Awesome. Definitely. Definitely. It was really, really cool. Um, that's awesome. And you're in, if I remember, um, are you in the South Bay or wh whereabouts are you? Yeah, I'm in Orange County. I'm in Huntington Beach. Orange County. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about you? Okay. I'm in Santa Clarita. Oh, okay. I've got some friends up in Santa Clarita. Cool. Um, yeah, so I've you know, uh, been there now for almost, um, gosh, 20 some odd years. Um, uh, my wife and we have three kids and, and, um, yeah, so it's just, uh, it's a circus, you know, having kids and, and everything. I don't know if you have any kids of yourself or. I have three. Okay. Yeah. So the same. Yeah, mine are, um, 20, 18 and 16. Oh, they're almost similar ages. Um, similar ages as mine. Mine are. Uh, my youngest is 20, my daughter's 22, and my son's 26. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're right there. Right there. That's awesome. Yeah, in fact, my boys live in, up, up in Northern California. They live together. Uh, my youngest is going to uh, UCSF up there, and then my older son works for Meraki Cisco, and then, and then my daughter lives with me. So. That's awesome. Yeah. That's very cool. Very yeah, cool. Very cool. Well, I don't know. I thought Dimples said she was going to jump on, and I don't know who else. She normally is on every single time, but okay. she's 19, so I don't know if she got delayed. But I'm going to go ahead and get started with the reading, and sure. uh, I'll share my screen. So 
when you watch this on replay, you'll be able to see the yeah. book. Okay, so we're starting at page 56 and it's the topographical map. And so I'll go ahead and start, okay? And since you're driving, I'll just read the whole, normally we take turns, but I'll just read the whole thing since you're driving. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks. So, the ancient Chinese considered the face to be a topographical map of personality, past experiences, and future potential. Most, I forgot to put my, there we go. Um, most important, the face shows what is going on or has gone on inside the body and in the mind, all of which change the landform. When I first learned about face reading, my grandmother talked about features being mountains and rivers. This is the fundamental yin-yang balance of the face based on the balance of cosmic chi. The mountains are the hard features that are composed of bone, the forehead, the cheekbones, the nose, the chin, and the jaw. These features create the structure and foundation of the face and have personality traits associated with them, such as stubbornness, willpower, bossiness, and ambition. The mountains are tied to the development of inherent yang chi, the cosmic father, and the rivers to inherent yin chi, the cosmic mother in utero. Very strong yang traits show strength of character and toughness. Therefore, people with large mountains would be seen as stronger physically, very set in their ways and living out in the world. Rivers are the soft features and exude fluid. The ears, wax, eyebrows, eyes, tears, the nostrils and groove mucus and the mouth, saliva. These features represent feelings. Large yin features indicate strength of emotions and depth of feelings and include traits such as generosity and sensuality. People with large rivers are very emotional, expressive, and creative. They have a stronger internal life and are more malleable and changeable de depending on their moods. Then there are also the plains and valleys of the face. Whenever there is extra padding on the face and the face is broad, there is the presence of the earth element or more human yin. Plump areas are considered the fertile plains and valleys. To have fullness of flesh in these areas is considered quite lucky as it indicates the ability to achieve abundance, a comfortable life and ease in accumulating things and or money especially if it involves the area known as money bags, the rounded lower cheek area. Sharp and pointed features and narrower faces reveal more human yang or the fire element. These people enjoy challenges and adventures in life. Too much hollowness or sunkenness of the face is like a desert where there is life but not in abundance. This topographical map of the face is one of the first ways to evaluate the facial landscape, but this landscape can change based on life experiences and an individual's reaction to them. Having a harder life will give you more mountains, whereas having an easier life gives you more plains. Your face can change as your life changes. Even more specific is reading of age positions, which is like reading a map that gives you the placement of cities along a highway. Specific incidents mark specific places recording the important events of a person's life. Age positions. Page 58. The ancient Chinese believed that the face recorded the life experiences of an individual and the effects of these experiences on the psyche and the body, similar to tracing a route on a road map taken in the past. This map was a tool for both diagnosis and prognostication. The ancient facial map and the facial meridians in figure 2-1 from 1601 was featured on the first page of an untitled manuscript about ancient medicine, Chinese medicine. Even older ancient facial maps were originally composed of 150 age positions and the specific places on the facial map marked ages from conception to 150 years old, which was the age the ancients believed was the possible lifespan of a human being. The oldest person known in modern times, Jean Calment, died at 122 years and 164 days old in France. 
Scientists are now validating that this increased lifespan is possible, but difficult to achieve. The average person in the United States lives to only 77.9 years, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. But longevity researcher Dr. Stephen Austin from the University of Idaho is betting that human beings achieve a lifespan of 150 years by the end of this century. I use the map with 100 years on it. Figures 2-2 and 2-3 for both men and women because it is, mu it is much more realistic to strive to become a centenarian. Okay, on a sidebar note here, I happen to know that there's over 1 million centenarians in the United States alone. Oh, wow. And we actually have a blue zone in California, which is right here at the Sierra Madre foothills, um, where we have, uh -huh. I can't remember how many, there's like, in that city, there's like several thousand uh, centenarians, which I thought, wow, that's a kind of a lot of people that are, you know, in their 90s to, from 90 to like 120. That is a lot, yeah. Age just right here in the Sierra Madre foothills in the San Gabriel Valley. So it's, it's a little- uh, What do you think that is uh, attributed to? Well, you know, I saw, they did a documentary on it and they featured the seven blue zones in the world. There was a place in, I think it was Fukuoka, Japan. It was uh, yeah. that, that uh, Sierra Madre city in um, the foothills here in the San Gabriel Valley. There was a place in Russia. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, there were seven places total in the world. There was a place like in, I think it was either, it was either Peru or Costa Rica. And one of the things that they attributed it was obviously diet and lifestyle. Um, all of the people that yeah. were featured in those blue zones. Oh, I remember one of the areas was in Italy. I don't remember exactly where in Italy, but uh, one of the things was that none of them retired. All of them continued to work. You know, like for example, there was a, a physician who was still seeing patients, still worked full time, was still working eight, nine hours a day, seeing patients from early in the morning till early evening. He was 92. His wife, I think was like 20, 18 or 20 years younger than him. So she was like 70 something. And yeah. um, they interviewed him and they interviewed her. And he looked like he was 70. He didn't look like he was 90 something. He wow. was trim, both of them were trim. And he absolutely loved being a physician, had been a physician for, I think, like 60 something years or something to that effect. Um, wow. Some patients five, six days a week, loved what he did, loved the patients, loved medicine, loves medicine. And yeah. uh, they talked about, they featured several men and women in that city. And they, one of the things that they featured was that in that particular city, there was a large population of people that belonged to, I think it was Seventh, Seventh Day Adventist Church. And so one of the things that that particular community of people in that group that they surveyed, they all had, um, they all ate organic, they all ate, you know, they all like shopped at the farmer's market. They ate, none of them ate TV dinners yeah. or highly processed foods or packaged foods. They ate food, you know, the way it comes out of the ground. So as real to its original source, as opposed to having something prepackaged. Um, the foods for the most part didn't have a lot of preservatives or, or man-made things, you know, imposed upon them. So they were, they are all, you know, whether they cooked their foods or they went out to eat, even when they went out to eat, they ate, you know, in places where that were, they were not necessarily vegetarian, but they were, it was like real food as opposed to man-made synthetic prepackaged food. And it was organic. Yeah, and people were physically active. Like they showed, an, they showed a, uh, there was a lady who I don't recall her name, but I remember her, her being like 103 or 104. And she was still going out to the gym every day and working out, you know, on a, uh, she, she volunteered every day. I can't remember at some sort of rec center so she got up and worked every day. And then like every day she would also, part of her regimen was to go work out. And they showed her on a, on a bicycle, you know, a stationary bike riding and lifting weights. Right. And, and here she was, you know, 103 years old and she could probably outwork people that are in their sixties and seventies. And right, right. she wasn't, 
She wasn't sitting around all day waiting for death to show up one day. She was actively participating in life and just, just you know, doing the things that brought her joy and um, keeping yeah, active. Right. And, and so, you know, you're keeping your body, your, your body was made to move. And so mm -hmm. as you move it, you oxygenate it. And, and if you're eating the right things, you're eating healthy and you, you know, of course, all the people, the one thing was that they were all, it seemed like most of them were relatively lean. I don't recall anybody being overweight. Everybody was right. either normal weight or on the more, the more slender side. Sure. Um, they showed a guy in, it was either Peru or Costa Rica. I don't remember, but he was like 80 something years old. You would have thought he was in his late fifties or sixties. He was outside in the sun, um, shirtless, just, and if you saw him, he looked like he must have been working out at the gym, the equivalent of somebody working out the gym here in our, you know, here in the States. But this guy had pecs, had muscles, you know, his forearms were really built. And, um, but he's there with a machete. I don't remember if it was weed or corn or there was some sort of crop. And he was a farmer. And so he was out there physically cutting, swinging, Let's see, right. let me stop the screen share. And I'm sure he was he was probably even maybe barefoot. I mean, you know, people talk about how the importance of grounding. You yeah. know, it's so for for uh, to be grounded to earth. He he may have been ground uh, I don't recall if he was barefoot or not. I just remember that he was out there in the sun, so he's getting plenty of sun. And yeah. he, and of course he's super physically fit because he's a laborer, you know, he's laboring he doesn't have to go work out at the gym because what he does for a living is keeping him fit right. he's out there he's getting plenty of cardio he's getting plenty of um you know the equivalent of weight training between cutting down you know the motions of sure. cutting down all the plants that he's harvesting and then carrying these right. large amounts of whatever the harvest is so he's physically active day in day out and um right, right. And so, you know, the, this particular documentary that I saw was, it was just fascinating to see, you know, people from the Western world here in California, you know, yeah. that gentleman who was in, in uh, Peru or Costa Rica, they had a few guys, like three guys from Italy, from a little town. And, you know, you could have easily thought that these guys were in their 60s, but they were in their late 80s and 90s. And I think one guy is like in his he was like 101 or 102 and wow. they were all active. They're all out there in their communities. They're not stuck in their homes by themselves. So that was yeah. the other thing. A lot of them had access also to being to, you know, going to the beach, either to the beach or to the mountains. They would either go to a lake or they would go to the beach, which obviously when you put your body in the ocean, even if you don't completely get immersed in the water, just putting your feet in the water automatically grounds you and you just, yeah. you receive a lot of minerals and iodine and a lot of health benefits just from putting your feet in the water. Sure. So, hi Chet, how are you doing? Good to see you again. So, yeah, so that was one of the common denominators uh, of all those people. Um, I'll have to see if I can find that documentary because it was really very informational talking about the blues. Yeah, it. it was a fascinating, um, fascinating reveal. It kind of goes in line with what she's saying here in this book, though. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good thing. That's awesome. Okay, so you guys ready to continue reading on, I think we're on page now 58. Let's see, here we go. Age 58. Okay, so the age position. So if you look here, this is the first one that they, she was saying that was from 1601, this figure 2.1, the yellow one. And this is the one that Dr. David actually mentioned in our class when we did the Chinese face reading in August. He actually showed this during the class. And and then Lillian Pearl Bridges here talks about figures 2.2 .2 and 2.3. Here's the female and there's the male map. And this goes to 100 years. 
One of the things that I noticed when I first got this book was if you notice here from 15 to, okay, from 15 to um, 48, this goes along from like the top of your head all the way to the base of your spine. 48 ends at the base of your spine. So it's kind of hard to remember a hundred spots, you know, on the body, on a face like this, but we already know that zero, zero to seven and um, seven to 14 are the ears, you know, this side zero to seven for the male and from yeah, zero to seven and the opposite for women. But if you can just remember that, if you look at these numbers they are all in a row, See how these in the middle here go all in a, on, on, they're all in a straight line? You can get a fair number of, of the numbers, 15 through 48, that, that's your entire spinal column from the top of your head to the base of your spine. So now all you have to do is just remember a, just a few more numbers. I don't know what 100, 71, 70, 60, 61, 60, and 51 are. That's just a few. If you just kind of do it in quadrants like that, then it makes it much easier to start to learn and to make sense of. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so on, here's the man's, which is 15 to 48. You'll see that it's the same for men and women. And then these are the same too, male and female, 51, 60, 61. See how the numbers are the same? Yeah. So we just have to look up to see what those mean, because I don't know off the top of my head. I just remember this is the top of your head to the base of your spine all along the nose here, which makes it easy to remember. So starting with this page, page 60. So numbers indicate Chinese age, subtract one year for Western age. Each child is born with a potential to live an approximate lifespan based on genetics, and each child's battery, their jing, starts off fully charged. And she mentions chapter one. The Chinese medical belief system is that over time, overuse and depletion of this fundamental inherited energy causes aging and disease. So one of the most important tenets in Chinese medicine is to conserve this jing to enhance longevity. However, whenever something traumatic or stressful occurs in a person's life, the face marks a specific place because some jing has been frozen from the fear reaction to the event or experience. So the Chinese extrapolated that the emotional side effects get lodged in the body and create disease in the organs. These life experience, whoops, sorry about that. These life experience markings are primarily horizontal and their placement also indicates the effects on certain organs. Over time, the face shows the major traumas that have occurred that are important to that individual and at the age when they happened. Knowing how to read these markings can help you track the patterns in a person's life. Western science has come up with an explanation as to why we remember all these traumas. The Chinese show how to read them from the face. So as a defense mechanism, one of the instinctive parts of the brain, the amygdala, has the ability to store emotional memories as a form of learning, which helps by warning us so that we can prevent a similar trauma from occurring again. Because of the desire to avoid a repeat of past events, people can shut themselves off from learning the lesson of the experience, and this can end up causing them to live reactively instead of consciously. Ironically, by trying to avoid repeating the experience, people actually attract and recreate similar experiences. People end up living in patterns that keep coming back to haunt them. It usually takes many repetition, whoops. It usually takes many repetitions before someone even recognizes the pattern and much willpower to avoid falling into the same trap again and again. Dr. Daniel J. Siegel explains it like this. The connections of neurons is an intricate network. The structure of the brain allows for learning to occur. It is the firing of the components of the network, the circuits of neurons that alters the probabilities of certain patterns firing in the future. If a certain pattern has been stimulated in the past, the probability of activating a similar profile in the future is enhanced. If the pattern is fired repeatedly, 
the probability of future activation is further enhanced. This patterning is how the brain learns from early childhood experiences. So much study has been done on the amygdala and its role as an early warning device for perceived potential pain and trauma. The amygdala is an almond-shaped structure on the top of the brainstem at the bottom of the limbic system. This part of the brain is tied directly to the nose and eyes through the thalamus and is responsible for the ability to feel fear or rage and to cry tears, and is also controls feelings of competition or cooperation. Looks like we lost someone. Are we, we lost someone, it looks like, oh, it looks like we lost. Um, the, lost Brian, but it might've been cause he's traveling and just drops service. Yeah, cause he's driving his car. So he'll probably okay. jump, back, jump back in a minute. So. Yeah, cause okay. the other one that was interesting is when you had the pictures up there and then you went to the mail, did you see that some of the numbers switch sides? No. Yeah. The numbers? What do you mean? The numbers of the face? Yeah. So on the on the female, 83 was over here. 83 was over here on the male. Certain oh, ones. Oh, so let's look at that. Forth. Yeah, let's look at that again. That's interesting. So. So 83. There's 93. Yeah, 93 and 83, and then back up the one page to the female, and there's several that switch sides. So here's 83, 84. Oh, you're right. Look at the 93 is on her left side, and 83 is on her right. And if you go... There's, there's more than just those two. There's a whole bunch. What, the 65 through 64 are different. See, down the middle, they're the same. So but on the, the sides, the they switch. That's fascinating. So 80... 88-2023. Can you see both faces there? Yeah, I can see them overlapped. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I don't know how you're doing that, but that's neat. Yeah, I'm interesting. So notice how 21, 24, 27 on the right side of her face is on the left side. Yeah, if, if right down the middle, they're the same. So it's only, so only the ones that are down the middle are the same and then the rest is all reversed. Mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. That's a great observation. So it's not just the ears, it's all those other things. Yeah, so it lets us know it's the, the whole side of the face. Yeah, I'm curious to find out what that 83, like what these, you know, 70, 72, 76, 76. Well, I'm guessing those are years. Because yeah, just like years. you look at the cross as far as the forehead and everything that was going in the ears, mm -hmm. those are age numbers. Yeah, I think you're right. Because you know what? The, um, I know that the, li the lifelines, like your lifeline, your 20s and 30s are mm -hmm. with your hairline. Then it goes 30s, 40s, 50s, um, and so forth. Well, yeah, you, well, the, the forehead is 15 to 25, roughly, 28. And I, and I usually just said 15 to 30, mm -hmm. and then 30 to 50. And then the nose is from 51 to 100. Looks like now, 51, but you know, is 100 like underneath the chin? Yeah, under, it's like, I think the tip of the chin is 100. Yeah, 50 to 70s, and then it bounces around back up in the in his left corner there i'm seeing 80 where's the eight, yeah, 83 oh 82 right there 81 yeah right under his earlobe right under the seventh ear you have 82 yeah i see 80, that 82 81 so 66 68 74 72 71 there's got to be a, a um like a way to make sense because here you have 80 
see. Well, if you know it real well, you'll and you see a line there. It's like, okay, what happened? You, know, you were just pointing. It's like, what happened at sixty-five? Yeah, like over here, as opposed to sixty-four. So right under the mouth, it's sixty-four, sixty-five. Mm-hmm. There's George. Is he coming back? Yeah, it looks like he's back. So, okay. yeah, it is kind of interesting because it does, um, you have 56, 57 on each side of the, like by each side of the purpose lines, it looks like. Yeah. You have like 54, 55 on either side of the mouth and then 64, it's like 10 years. Mm -hmm. 64, 54. I wonder where 34, 32, 34 is like, oh, 33. Okay, under the, 33, 34 under the eyebrows. Yeah, right under the eyebrows. Yeah, so, so 20s, 30s, where's, I don't see, I see 43, 44, 42. It's like right in the middle of the face here. And then 50s, 60s, 70s. 70s, and then I guess it goes to the side of the face. Right. Yeah, up once. It looks like it's going up one side from the, it's like the, the corner back of the, of the jaw. Yeah. So in front of the jaw and then kind of behind the jaw. So 70s, 80s, and then 90s on the other side. It's kind of fascinating. Okay. Wow. It's announced. He's here. You yeah. Need Need to go let him in. I'm gonna have to run in a minute and go meet my daughter's boyfriend. Okay. But I'll um, if you I'll want be to back. Wait a second because uh, don't call him that. Don't freak him out. Because George George fell off. It looks like his connection since he's driving fell off. Yeah. Well, I wasn't gonna shut off. I was just gonna. I've got to go let him in. Oh, okay. So if you want to go ahead and do that, I'll just wait for you. Um, okay. Yeah. Sing to me while, because I can still hear you as I go down the stairs. Okay, I'll, I can keep reading if you want. <laughs> we'll see. Hang on. I don't know who you are, but hello. Hi. I think I met you in Vegas. So, here we go, Dr. People end up living. Okay. Okay. So back to. And what page are you on? I am on page. 60, I think. Let me see. I gotta move this so I can see what page we're on. Page 60. Let's see what page, because now I'm on 52. Yeah, page 60 of the PDF. There we go. Yeah. All right. Okay, so. Um, because I was just bringing up my PDF, trying to get to where it was, where we we're at. Okay, yeah, it's on page 60. And so Dr. Daniel J. Siegel explains it like this. The connection of neurons is an intricate network. The structure of the brain allows for learning to occur. It is the firing of the components of the network, the circuit of neurons that alters the probabilities of certain patterns firing in the future. So if a certain pattern has been stimulated in the past, the probability of activating a similar profile in the future is enhanced. If the pattern is fired repeatedly, the probability of future activation is further enhanced. This patterning is how the brain learns from early childhood experiences. Um, one thing I was going to mention here is this makes a lot of sense when, with all the training that we've had with Dr. David, both just the multiple modalities um, you know, that we learned with him. It's like once you bring something to light, especially when, let's say specifically as we're looking at the Chinese face reading, he said, once you call out and bring to light whatever the trauma was that created the line in the face, oftentimes by your just bringing that to light, that line or that wrinkle will now disappear because it releases the energy. Well, 
uh, one of the things that I just recently learned after having Dr. David's training is, which I'm surprised, I was pre-med bio, and I don't remember learning this um, when I was pre-med bio, but I learned recently that one of the things that animals do is that every time an animal engages in um, a fight type of mm -hmm. response where you know they're having to use a fight or flight response because they're engaging in battle with another animal, uh -huh. as soon as that traumatic experience is done, yes. the animal will actually, once it's in a safe place and it knows that that's behind them, it'll literally shake its body head to tail because it is removing the energetic trauma patterns that are in its body and it releases it on purpose. It's an instinctive thing that they do so that they don't hold on to the trauma in their body because they know that if they hold on to that energetic patterning of trauma in their body, mm -hmm. it's going to impede them in the future. So they shake head to toe, releasing that energy so that now their body is completely it's it's like a reset. The only way that makes sense because in Reiki, when you're done, you just brush everything off and cut the cords and you know, throw it away and get rid of their energy because you don't want to take it with you. Exactly. So one of the things that we can do now, knowing this between what we learn in Chinese space reading and disinformation and what we're reading here now, is that if we just as as our you know, part of our, uh, just like we brush our teeth and we do all sorts of other things as habit, part of our health and well-being and, you know, it's good hygiene. Just shaking your body, literally jumping in place and shaking head to toe where you mm -hmm. just shake everything out. That would be a good practice to incorporate because you're literally letting the energy go from anywhere in your body. Whether you are aware that you have anything or not, it really becomes irrelevant. It's kind of like, you're not brushing your teeth because you feel that there's an onset of a cavity. No, it's preventive maintenance so that you don't get a cavity. You're going to brush your teeth every day, no matter what. So if we start to pay, be mindful about this and just decide, you know what, I'm going to start to just as a daily practice every morning, I'm just going to shake it up. Or maybe every night before I go to sleep, just going to shake everything out. You're going to be releasing anything that might be a, energetic traumatic pattern that maybe is unbeknownst to you stuck somewhere in your body. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go on here to the second paragraph. Much study has been done on the amygdala and its role as an early warning device for perceived potential pain and trauma. The amygdala is an almond shaped structure on the top of the brainstem at the bottom of the limbic system. This part of the brain is tied directly to the nose and eyes through the thalamus and is responsible for the ability to feel fear or rage and to cry tears. And it also controls feelings of competition and cooperation. Joseph Ledoux of the Center for Neuroscience at New York University is the pioneer in this field of study. He has found that the amygdala can take over control of the body and its reactions before the neocortex has a chance to respond. The amygdala relays emergency information and it is responsible for emotional reactions without any conscious information or understanding. This demonstrates that the emotions have a way of being activated independently and that vivid emotional memories are stored in the amygdala. The mm. amygdala remembers all associated clues that accompany a traumatic or stressful event, which is why you may love the smell of your lover's cologne until he breaks up with you, at which point you can't stand it as it has become associated with the pain of the breakup. We have all- Oh, wow. Yeah, like I've that. had that. Yeah, I think we all have. And I think this is so fascinating because think about it. it. If you think about where the amygdala is positioned inside your brain, it's at the center, right close to where you're pineal gland is in between where your pineal and your pituitary gland is at the center of your brain, right behind where your eyes and your nose are. And is it interesting? You know, we know about VACOG, visual auditory, kinesthetic, gustatory, and olfactory. We're, we're aware that your amygdala is right behind. It's like literally just a few centimeters away from your eyes and from your nose. 
whenever you have any kind of um, a trauma and you have a fear response or you have pain, the first thing that your eyes are going to want to do is to release that emotional energy is to tear up and your eyes and your nose are connected, you know, to work together because your nose will run, your eyes will run, yeah. but it's right there, like a few centimeters away from your amygdala. So your amygdala is able to, I don't know if your amygdala sends it to your nose and eyes first or your eyes and nose send it to your amygdala, but obviously there's a transmission of information that's like right there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It makes sense. Yeah. And it's also talking about how before your cognitive, before your brain is able to register that something emotional is going on, your amygdala is already firing and wiring in anticipation. Before you even have an emotional response, it's already attuned to something in advance. Hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. So. I was still thinking about the perfume and oh, yeah. I was had a girlfriend for years and ran across and now I can't even remember the name of the thing. But I just loved the perfume. And so I bought it for a few girlfriends after her. Mm -hmm. And then I got married and I tried to buy it. And she goes, Oh, I don't like perfumes, I'm allergic and everything else. And she tried it a couple of times and went, I don't remember this. And even smelling it, it's like, how come it smelled better? So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because it's tied to that emotional experience. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, on Cess, it was great. And there was a couple others that I said, oh, yeah, this stuff smells good here and gave it to them. But that was like my perfume that I gave to girlfriends. And then. Because you had a positive association with it. Yeah, it was positive on all of them and you know, there wasn't anything negative there but like i said once i got married and she was saying oh I, i'm allergic to everything i can't have it but a couple of times it's like here smell this and put it on or i'd go to the store and it's like oh yeah let me smell that and it's just like it doesn't smell anywhere near as good so yeah it's, cha it's changed yeah and it made me wonder it's like oh yeah that's an old formula we had, it's a new formula. Oh. But I thought, why would somebody change their formula if it, you know, you'd think, well, we'll just keep selling that. It doesn't sell as much anymore, but with new formula, we'll call it something new and see if we can promote the market it. Yeah. For the yeah. people that liked it. Yeah, because there's, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So it says here, resisting your patterns encourages them to happen again. <laughs> well, Don't we all resist them? This persists. And here we have the scientific proof. Resisting your patterns encourages them to happen again. So for example, I have had many female clients who have sworn <laughs> that they will never marry domineering and controlling men. What do they do? They marry domineering and controlling men, just like their fathers. <sighs> they marry men oh. who are the exact opposite. The man who dominates through his passivity by forcing her to act like the dominator or they marry men who get sick and their lives become dominated by the circumstances of illness. Oh, what a nightmare. One way or another, they keep on repeating their patterns until they realize from where it stems. Doesn't that sound exhausting? Yeah. Some, I was talking to somebody today and it's like, why do you keep making the same mistake over and over and over until you learn from it? And then it's like, God gives you a new one to deal with. Well, that's so funny that you should mention that because uh, I was just talking to somebody earlier today. And one of the things that I was um, mentioning to them is that, you know, we have people, it's like one of the number, you know, I really believe that we all came to this earth planet experience for us to learn about the different aspects of love. And one of the aspects of love is self-love. And so you have all these characters, you know, parents, siblings, neighbors, teachers, uh, friends, uh, you name it. And they're all teachers, you know, depending on the level of rub that you have. Some of them, your own kids, some yeah. of them stepkids or any combination, any kind of relationship dynamic that you can think. It could be a boss, it could be a coworker, but they're all teachers. 
and they're there to show you how to self-love and how to discover and create self-mastery so that if you have somebody that's triggering you that's allegedly pissing you off the, tr the truth is nobody can piss you off you're choosing to respond yeah pissed off but nobody can make you feel anything you know you're the one feeling it inside of their your body not them they can do something and you can choose to react in anger react being pissed off not reacting that's a choice too so when you realize it's like okay i can hit the pause button i don't have to react i don't have to act at all i can just stay as an observer and decide wait a minute before i act on this let me think about this and see what's really going on getting pissed that doesn't feel good it doesn't solve anything freaking out that doesn't feel good either and that doesn't <laughs> fix anything wait a minute if i just take a step back and take a different perspective and choose to now how do i reframe this and how do i mold the clay in the in this minute oh i can actually affect the outcome and in the face of something unwanted i can convert it into the wanted and it doesn't have to take days weeks months or years oh that's a better solution but we're not taught that as kids most of us are not taught that yeah. as yeah. a kid so so i've learned it's like okay that is an option and you don't have to be a buddhist zen shaolin monk living in the himalayas or in tibet isolated from humanity you can learn this in this western civilization and the faster we come to grips with it and start to see what that looks like in a modern world like where you and i live the quicker we're able to go oh wait a minute okay what you know baby steps one step at a time i'm like okay you start to implement it a little bit at a time and as unwanted because it's when you have the unwanted that gives you the opportunity to mold the clay if it's the way you want it there's nothing to change right it's the way you want it it's when you have the unwanted stuff whether it's with people or an event or i mean i think that's what this whole global pandemic as a collective our whole world is learning what's going on that's a teacher for all of us as a collective to learn yeah this is a lot of unwanted stuff instead of reacting we need to learn okay what's my role in this how do i mold the clay how do i instead of reacting to all the control manipulation and all the stuff that's going on outside if you can foster that peace from the inside first and not react wait a minute then it doesn't matter how crazy stuff gets out here i'm centered i'm like i'm happy and peaceful it doesn't matter there's a shit storm going around i'm like i'm still cool i'm like oh they can't push my buttons they can't push my buttons they can't control me hmm. so who has the upper hand now then you have the upper hand but it seems like everybody's taught anymore. It's not my fault that you piss me off. But nobody, so. it's like nobody pisses you off. You piss yourself off. Exactly. When you know that, it's like, hang on, why am I choosing to react? But we've been, we've bought into society says, oh yeah, that person pisses you off, just cut them off. Just, it's like, wait a minute, no. The, uh, they're not feeling that. They may feel something. But you're the one who's feeling the anger, feeling the pissed off, the jealous, whatever the negative, positive, negative, any kind of emotion, you're the one who feels it in your body. They may have a, a sense of it, but you're, you're responsible for what you feel inside your body. Nobody has so much power that they can make me feel anything. Not if I don't allow it, unless I want to give my power away which a lot of us have been conditioned by society to give our power away and believe, you know, that person ticks me off, you know, strangers tick me off, piss me off. Yeah, it's never my fault. It's everybody oh, else. It's all there. It's not there. It's like, well, yeah, the truth is it's not, it's not everybody's responsibility to make me happy and make me feel good inside. They don't know how I feel inside my body. It's my responsibility. Unless I'm a victim, then it's everybody else's responsibility. Yeah, if you're truly a victim. If you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but even the languaging, it's like, 
You know? Oh, languaging is terrible anymore. Yeah, it's like, oh, I'm sad. I'm like, no, you're not. Last time I looked up in the dictionary, I looked up the word sad. It didn't have your name in your face as a synonym. Sad is a feeling that you feel. It's a temporary state of being, but you aren't the feeling of sadness. You may be feeling sad, but it's a misnomer to say, I'm sad. And then you have to correct him saying, so why are you choosing to feel sad? Because it is a choice. It's all a choice, but we've give, we, we are so conditioned to giving our power away until we, and it takes a while for us to learn how to take our power back so that with our words, with our behavior, because our words only come out because we're thinking it first. So you have to think it, say it, and be it so that you don't get stuck in that loop that everybody else is in so that you get the results that everybody else is getting. But yeah. it's, a, it's a long process and nobody can do it for you. We all have to do it ourselves. Do it or don't do it, either way. Okay, let's go on. We're gonna keep on page 62. So, One way or another, they keep on repeating their pattern until they realize from where it stems. And when they are able to recognize the issue when it returns, they can choose to deliberately step out of the pattern and continue to practice an alternative choice. So unfortunately, tests will continue to come because it takes a lot of work to overcome patterns. The good news is that the tests get easier and occur less often. What used to come from a caregiver like a parent is transferred to a relationship with a significant other and then to friends and possibly later to coworkers and eventually to associates that you don't care very much about. The more distance the person is who brings you the lesson, the better you are doing. The facial map helps show you where the issues begin and when they have reoccurred. Ooh, we're gonna have to take a closer look at that to see how that plays out, don't you think? Yeah. So it says here, any traumatic or stressful event is remembered and the pain of that event can be a physical or psychological memory. The amygdala does not appear to distinguish between the two. Wow, so that's fascinating. Any and I think not only physical and psychological, but unless they're taking the psychological as far as emotional. Yeah, so it says there, traumatic or stressful event is remembered and the pain of that event can be a physical or psychological memory. The amygdala does not distinguish between the two. Memories that are pre-verbal before the age of three are the most firmly implanted in this part of the brain. And that is one of the reasons our most primal or core issues are so hard to work with. Things like phobias, now called anxiety disorders, and our relationships with food and love. Dr. Siegel explains that experiences that involve lower emotional intensity seem to do little to arouse focal attention and have a higher likelihood of being registered as unimportant and therefore not easily recalled later on. Events experienced with a moderate to high degree of emotional intensity seem to get labeled as important and are more easily remembered in the future. It is the emotions that create the meaning of the event and determine what is stored and what is forgotten. The problem with the amygdala is that by storing important emotional memories, it helps set up a belief system that results in a life lived reactively instead of with conscious intent. Because we try so hard to avoid reoccurrence of past hurts, we actually magnetize them back to us by our fear. Ooh, yeah, because it's an elevated emotion. Mm -hmm. Whenever you have an elevated, you have a visualization of anything, doesn't matter if it's a memory of the past or a future vision that you're forecasting as a memory of the future. If you have an elevated emotion, that's what fuels it and magnetizes it to happen now. Doesn't matter if it's a positive or negative thing. So if you're fueling it with fear, it's going to pull it into your reality. If you feel it with love, joy, appreciation, and gratitude, you pull it into your present. That's what yeah, one called. of the, one of the classes that I was taking. He was talking about. Your memories are just memories, but you make them up to mean what you want them to mean. How you frame them. Yeah. 
So everybody's like, oh, it's so terrible. And you run through it over and over and over again because that's kind of how we're conditioned. And he showed that he broke this lady of it and she was talking about her rape and just cracking up. She was, oh, yeah, it was bad. It was terrible. Oh, yeah, I was raped. Uh -huh. Where before she was just, oh, and it controlled her. And when she finally realized, I don't have to let it happen. Over and most of the time, what our memories remember isn't what happened. It's what we think happened. Yeah, it's made worse by how we frame and think about it. Right. Adding the fuel to the fire. Yeah, it says here, the fear sets us up to create similar emotional experiences by our avoidance. Mm. So you're, you're fearing that something bad's going to happen and you're deflecting so that that doesn't repeat itself. And that very action is what makes it happen again. So ultimately, the pattern that is set can block qi and jing and can lead to specific diseases. Actually, she hasn't mentioned this here, but this whole pattern that we just read in the last couple paragraphs, what she doesn't mention is that you have your reticular activating system that looks for patterns. And when you say, whether you, let's say you're trying to avoid red flags mm -hmm. as a cliche, you know, red flags in a relationship, red flags out as you're driving because you don't want to cross a red flag, you don't want to get a ticket. Guess what? Your avoidance of those red flags, your reticular activating system now says, pay attention to all the red flags. Now you see red flags everywhere. It's kind of like, you know, you decided to buy a Civic Honda and you never saw civic, white Civic Hondas on the road before, but now you decided to buy a white Civic Honda. Now everybody has a white Civic Honda. Every time you drive, you see white Civic Hondas of the same year that, you're bought, that you bought one. And it's just because the RAS, whatever it is you focus on, that's what it looks for. And that's how it sorts, sifts and separates your reality. So your avoidance, fear of something makes you focus on what it is you don't want. So you get what you don't want. So it says here, at some point, we all need to overcome our biggest issues and live a life we choose rather than one in which we simply keep reacting to repetitious circumstances. Mm. So the facial map has the amazing ability to show people when in their life traumatic or stressful incidents occurred at what approximate age, how severe these experiences were, and when the pattern has repeated. Interestingly, good and bad stresses make the same kind of markings. The ancient Chinese caution that getting too excited I disagree with this, but they say that getting too excited is also bad for your health. Here is the most important factor about issues and patterns. It doesn't matter what happens to you. It only matters how you feel about it. It's the perception of the event that marks the face, and there should be no judgments or comparison made. Everyone has different levels of sensitivities and abilities to cope. I've seen similar depth of markings in someone whose best friend moved away in third grade and in another person who was involved in a bad accident at the same age. The ancient Chinese started looking for markings from the time of conception on the ear, and they believe that the in utero experience is the most important time in a person's life, and they considered those 10 months to be the equivalent of the first year. The events, conditions, and traumas of this period and the birth experience itself are the foundation for the expression of genetic structure and constitution. The markings on the ear also reflect the mother's emotional state during pregnancy. It means that we should really pay closer attention to those ears that we're reading. My grandmother used to say the personality of a baby was affected by the personality of its mother while she was pregnant. This is one of those old wives tales that has recently been proven true by modern scientists neuropeptides the emotional messengers of the brain are transmitted via bloodstream across the placental barrier and end up in the baby's bloodstream thus affecting the child's future moods furthermore when a woman experiences significant stress while pregnant events such as a parent or spouse dying being in an accident or getting very sick the blood flow to the fetus constricts 
at this time because blood is food and food equals love and nurturing, the fetus goes into distress and ends up being born very tough. These babies have strong survival skills, high APGAR scores, Ooh. but are non-bonders. Oh my gosh, that's kind of good to know. Especially if you're dating. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, we gotta pay attention to that. They have poor ability to connect emotionally or physically. They often dislike touching and become difficult or aloof children. Mm. Wow. Many issues start in utero. Feelings of all kinds are transmitted and end up lodging in the baby's body, waiting to be recalled and turned into primitive beliefs. For those who are skeptical about this, scientists have discovered that so much is transferred to the fetus in utero that specific flavors from food the mother ingests get passed on and end up in the amniotic fluid to be tasted by the fetus. This accounts for a great number of food preferences, sensitivities, and cravings that are hard to fight later in life. Ooh, interesting. The in utero experience starts making on the right, oh, the in utero experience starts marking on the right ear for women and on the left ear for men. This involves the yin yang of the face along with the rest of the early childhood as shown in figure 2-4. First, look for the face where the upper and lower parts of each parts of the ear attach to the face. Right above this area is a place where conception is shown, and the first half inch above that is the gestation period culminating in birth. Any marking, indentation, notch, groove, thinned out area, wrinkle, spot, or discoloration has a meaning. For example, many people who are unwanted have a thinning of this area. Whereas wanted babies or easy pregnancies, a good in utero experience, are wide and unmarked. Almost everyone has some kind of marking at birth. It is a very difficult experience. I have seen veining on the ear as an indication of lack of oxygen or a line that shows emotional issues or an indentation indicating a physically traumatic birth, e.g. being stuck in the birth canal for a long time, which usually leads to claustrophobia, and many issues get formed from the birth experience. So, okay, let's see if we can figure out some of these things. She, she has figure 2-4, which is, okay, the ear. It's that one there. Mm -hmm. And she says, first look for the place where the upper and lower parts of the ear attach to the face. Okay, so look for the place where the upper and lower parts of the ear attach to the face. So basically, where this part, conception, conception yeah. here, and then the ear lobe, so where it attaches. So here, here, so this, these spots, and then where it attaches to the face here, here. So see how these have the, uh, how it's, um, clefted in these two cases, but in this one, it goes straight into the face. So this person is very attached to their family. If you recall by what Dr. David Snyder talked about in his class, this person has to be close to their family. They won't, you know, they're very attached to their family as opposed to this person is more independent. They're able to, you know, get along uh, more independently. They also have those intuition auditory lines here which suggests that there was a lot of yelling, potentially verbal, verbal and potentially physical abuse in the family, whereas this one doesn't have it. It's completely smooth. You notice that? Yeah, but they also look like you know, 20s, 30s, 50s, 70s. But yeah, the, it's, it's, it's like A and B look like they could be 60. almost the same person, but... Yeah, they're different. They're real similar. They're different, but these are people probably, I'd say, over 60. And yeah. Probably a 20, 30 something, maybe mm -hmm. something for sure. Um, I want to see what else she said here. Okay, right above this area 
is a place where conception is shown and the first half inch above that is the gestation period culminating in birth. Any marking, indentation, notch, groove, thinned out area, wrinkle, spot, or discolor discoloration has a meaning. So let's look at that. Well, it's like... So conception is like right... Oh, okay, so see how here this one's rounded in the diagram? Mm -hmm. Let's see how this one's like pointed. Actually, both of these people have it pointed. It's more rounded in this person, but this one, it's like, so I want, that's got to mean something. Because over here, see how it's not as pointed? It's more rounded off. Yeah. Hmm. Ah. So that's telling you have conception. It's right there. And then depending on the condition here, it tells you, like, see how she has like a fold here? So something must have hap happened right after, like. That's what I'm getting. Yeah. This one doesn't have, you have the hairs a little bit in the way, so it's a little harder to tell. It, it looks sunken, but not as bad. Yeah, but this one definitely, you have a notch here, whereas this mm -hmm. one doesn't really have a notch. It says, uh a line that shows emotional issues, an indentation indicating physically traumatic birth. So that seems like maybe she had a physically traumatic birth, stuck in the birth canal. Numbers indicate Chinese age, subtract a year for Western age. Men start counting on left ear, women on right. Yeah, so this is the left ear. We don't know. Actually, this might be a man and I think this one might be a woman, but it's kind of hard to tell just looking at the ear. So basically, yeah. yeah, you're right. I feel like one, their A and C are definitely female, but yeah. This I think is a man, and I think this is a woman. Well, that's what I'm thinking, but yet you don't see any beard in the side. Yeah. Yeah, you don't, or sideburns. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if this is a woman, so then this would be zero to seven for a female. And so, yeah, I notice, see how she's got a little, instead of it being smooth all the way around, mm -hmm. something happened here when she's, yeah, zero, one, it's around two, two to three years of age. And then it, see how it narrows here? Instead of it being the same, it, it gets really thin here. Right. See how this one's more like smoother, but hers is like all of a sudden gets pinched in here. So at like around three, four years of age, something narrowed, narrowed that. And then it comes back out again, down to seven years of age. So bumps or protrusions are considered positive beneficial periods. Bumpiness indicates a period that is rocky, both good and bad. Basically, what goes up must go down, and that includes moods. Holes or notches indicate a very specific incidence that caused trauma, usually physical. So I wonder, see how she has kind of like a corner here? Yeah. So I wonder, like, see, this one has it like right here at the top. Whereas she has it over mm -hmm. here. So something specific must have happened, some sort of traumatic thing, something physical. Yeah. And C, it'd be when she was nine. Mm -hmm. It could be accident, injury, physical abuse, an operation. So, oh, so it says here, A is a woman. You were right. Shows a difficult birth. See how it's so like. Interesting. Difficult. It's saying. B and C are men. Oh, both of them are men? Yeah, if you just, where it says A, this woman shows oh, a difficult yeah, yeah, part. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then it says B, this man has a strong marking with discoloration at the age of 12. So he has a strong marking 
with discoloration at the age of 12. So right there. Yeah, right there. I would not have thought of that as a discoloration because it almost looks like a freckle, but that's considered a discoloration. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, because the ears are red. Yeah, they're all red except there. And see, he has it all the way across. Interesting. At the age of 12, he has that discoloration. This fan has a strong notch at Western age of two for this C. So when he was two years of age, showing specific traumatic event happened to him. However, he had a good birth experience. So his good, yeah, see how it's much smoother than here. This is more rocky. This is a lot smoother. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Ears that look as though the cartilage gets thinner or is cut away show that this period was difficult because something important was taken away. For example, it may represent the death of a parent or grandparent or loss of attention because of a sibling's birth. I actually have that. Hmm. Uh, when the ear looks as if it has been pushed down, punched or pinched, it means that this was a suppressive period. This may have been a time of much discipline or could indicate circumstances such as war or poverty that pressed down on the human spirit. Any markings on the ears needs to be evaluated. So, like, if you see, let me do a stop here. <sighs> how my ear has like a knot, like, see how it's like. Yeah, I see that. That's when when I was two, my brother was born. <laughs> so I went from being the princess to all of a sudden, my two year, my my newborn brother stole my thunder. It wasn't just that, because the day that he was born, um, I also had, you know, I'm two years old, so, you know, you've been now walking for the better part of a year, and then I had cast put on both of my feet up to my knees, so oh, wow. all of a sudden, that, I couldn't walk, because the casts on my feet were too heavy, and then they, they brought me home from, um, you know, the orthopedist, and then later that day, my brother was born, so it's like, I was pissed, because all of a sudden, I couldn't walk. And now and it might not be that your brother was born as much as you were upset just because you couldn't walk. Yeah, it would. Those were the two main things that happened that day. So I was I was mad that whole day from the time they put that on. And I realized that I because they were too heavy. I couldn't pick my feet up. I couldn't walk. And then to boot, my brother was born that day. So I don't know if it was it could have been just the because that happened first. And then my brother was born later that day. So. Um, yeah, but You're already, you were already mad. I was mad and I'm not generally speaking a mad, I don't get mad easily, but that day I was not a happy camper. And then I remember looking at my younger brother and my mom said that, um, she had put me on the bed and the bass, the baby bassinet was right next to the bed. And I remember doing this on purpose, actually. <laughs> I remember just kind of looking at him and he was sleeping. And I conveniently, on purpose, rolled on top of him. And I was, at a year old, I was 30 pounds. So I don't know what I weighed at two years old, but I was obviously over 30 pounds. And so now you have like this seven, eight, nine pound baby. <laughs> and I just rolled on top of him and he started going, Wah! So my mom comes running in. She's like, oh my gosh, you're squishing the baby. <laughs> so she grabbed me and who knows, I don't remember if she spanked me or not, but I know I got in trouble. And, um, but I remember doing that on purpose. <laughs> I squished him on, I just literally rolled right on him. <laughs> so mean, but I was two, you know. <laughs> the things kids do. Anyhow. Yep. Okay, so where is... Okay, so moving on to the next page. So we all have many issues from the past, and they are worth finding out about. Interview your parents, siblings, and other relatives, and you will discover many of the reasons why you do what you can't help doing. 
but don't worry if you can't find them in the past because they're destined to be repeated later and you can start working with them anytime you recognize a pattern. There are many issues to which we are predisposed because of circumstances of our lives. Over the years, I have noticed that premature babies grow up to have major issues with time. Hmm, this is interesting. They are usually very early or very late because they live according to a different clock. They tend to be late bloomers. Babies who aren't picked up or held have issues with affection. Babies who are left to cry believe that their needs won't get met when they speak. I have a number of clients who have issues because they were the wrong sex. Many factors that affect our lives every day stem from our events of which we have no memory because they occurred when we were so young. Many previous issues repeat on a regular basis or cycle, which causes the ears to mark in a very similar way and in the same place on the other ear. Symmetric markings may simply reflect the genetic structure of the ear, but it may be a repeated pattern or the potential for a repeat of the pattern. Two bumps at the age of three and 10 will look the same because something beneficial that occurred at three can often have a repeat performance seven years later. Hmm. Many of these markings that are made before you reach the, that age were set up in utero as an issue with a specific shelf life. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, what's a shelf life? Mm. Yeah, so apparently there's a certain uh, amount of time before it expires and then it sounds like it'll resurface again. Oh, it's setting it up in the next paragraph. Yeah, so much like a milk carton that gives you an expiration date. Oh, yeah, yeah. The body is willing to hold on to certain emotions for only a set time. That's the shelf life they're talking about. Depending on the strength of the organ that is holding the emotion for you. So when it is time for that issue to reemerge, almost anything can trigger it, like the straw that breaks the camel's back. We often find issues reappearing, even though the circumstances are not that similar to those that sparked the original occurrence, but the associated feelings are similar. Ultimately, if you don't process these issues and free yourself from their hold, it takes a toll on your body. The longer someone waits to deal with an issue, the more likely it is to affect the person's energy and health. Yeah. It's better to discover your issues earlier rather than later because you have more energy to deal with them when you are younger. So it sounds, I'm just going to pause right here. It sounds like one of the greatest things that we can do to gift our children is to have them recognize whatever these energetic patterns are um, as early as possible so that they are as free of these, of these energetic patternings in their body as they move on so that they can move on to bigger and better things and have more energy um, so that they can, you know, fulfill themselves as opposed to, you know, like us, we're learning about this, you know, now at this point, you know, 40 plus years of age. Yeah. So one of my students gave me proof that the ears mark with childhood trauma. She was a pretty young woman about the age of 25 who had come to a golden path workshop. And in that course, I require students to bring baby pictures of themselves to help them start tracking their life issues. She brought the pictures of when she was born, and it was very clear that she had smooth, unmarked ears. She had gone through a very traumatic period from the age of three until she was about eight with chronic ear infections to the point that she had to have surgery and lost part of her hearing ability. Ooh, there's something. Wow. She, she probably had people yelling in her household. household. That's why she didn't want to hear. So her ears got chronic ear infection. That's my, what I would think is going on. Yeah, it's like, what didn't you want to hear? She, she didn't want to hear something. So her ears just closed off and they got infected because she couldn't stand the, the you know, and kids' ears are more sensitive than grownups. So she, that's probably why she had those chronic ear infections. Well, it makes sense because I was working with a lady and we're driving home from National Guild of Hypnotists Convention. And I just happened to say to her, and we're doing work in trance, how long have you been wearing glasses? And she goes, since I was a kid. And I said, what happened when you were a kid? 
that you didn't want to see? And exactly. she said, I watched my bro my father beat my little brother to death. <gasps> yeah. And I said, okay, now that you've done that and you know what you didn't want to see and you've dealt with it going on, do you need your glasses? And she was nearsighted, so she only saw things up close. She couldn't see things far away. We're driving down the freeway at 70, and she's reading me billboards without her glasses on. Wow. And I was like, interesting. You know, I learned something that day from her. And wow. So I'll ask people, you know, when you see something. That is, you know, that makes, makes perfect sense makes perfect perfect sense so i gotta yeah. figure out because when i was i think i started wearing glasses in in uh when i was five when i was in kindergarten so i wonder what was going on that i didn't want to see was it i don't know if I was and you might not remember where you'd need to do trance and go in and just let it pop up yeah and okay. and that's what we were doing so maybe yeah maybe maybe you and i could do a session because um, I wonder what, because I had eye surgery when I was five years old, too. Like, the two things that happened when I was, my, you know, kindergarten, um, the fall, that kindergarten year, the first thing was that I ended up having to have eye surgery. Because I think I started wearing glasses, my mom said, when I was, like, three, which I vaguely remember. And then, so I, I, I had, do you know what lazy eye is? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I had a lazy eye. So basically, the muscles... Uh, on the inside and the outer of my eye was were too loose, so they actually did surgery on both of my eyes to tight to shorten those muscles to make to make sure that they were you know straight. And then I wore training glasses for I don't know how many years to, to uh, strengthen my eye muscles. Yada yada. So I've worn glasses and you know lenses pretty much my whole life, which I still have. I hate to wear them. I, should get, I guess well, I should you wear contacts now then. I hate to wear my glasses, but <laughs> so I just make, since it's a computer, I can make the font bigger so I don't have to wear these in public unless I absolutely have to. Well, do you wear contacts? Um, sometimes, but not all the time. Yeah, but it's got a yeah. pretty good amount of uh, prescription. You know what I mean? I can't buy them like at the drugstore, actually. Yeah, as far as the strength, too. Yeah, the strength, it's got a pretty good amount of strength, so... Um, yeah, but I'd be kind of curious to see, uh, uh, you know, what the scoop is there. Hmm. Anyhow, but my parents, so I know it wasn't, I don't, uh, my parents never argued in front of us. So, but obviously. Wish I could say that. Yeah, my parents never, I didn't think that uh, well, until, until I went to college i didn't think that grown-ups argued to be honest with you because since i never saw my parents argue i figured well as far as people don't argue it's only children who argue yeah so i well, thought it was i really fine. didn't see my parents argue but i've done it a lot in front of my children and i took her today she says dad i don't trust you and i don't want to tell you what's going on with me but I'd relaxed her enough to say she wanted therapy, so I took her to a friend today. And oh, she that's spent wonderful. Two and a half hours with him doing hypnosis and Reiki. And she's, she's like, Yeah, nothing happened. I feel about the same. And then maybe an hour later, she goes, Well, I'm in a good mood. It's like, From the depressed person to a good mood? Okay. But that's wonderful. You can't call her out on it. So now we'll see what happens. Wow. And that was, was that your daughter, Soraya? No, that's Alexis. Alexis. I've got, um, she, yeah, I've, she's my youngest. She's 17. Oh, and she's one younger than, one that's younger than Soraya. Yeah. So, and she lives in Charleston, South Carolina with her mother. Oh my gosh. So she lives on the other side of the country. Yeah. And, wow. and so she came out for a week and was supposed to go home today, but oh. she talked her mother into letting her stay for another 10 days. Oh, nice. And a bunch of stuffs came up, and I said, hey, we're going to go do therapy. And the other night got into it, and she was expecting me to get mad at her like I used to. And I said, I've been working a lot on me, and I'm not the same person. And she goes, yeah. 
I noticed that on the last phone call we really had that I was like, oh man, it's my dad. And she got, she FaceTimed me and we talked for a few and she, we hung up and the guy that she's seeing said, well, he seems cool. She goes, yeah, my dad is cool. And all of a sudden realized he didn't get upset. He didn't chew me out for this and that. He just listened and went along and was there. And she went, yeah, he's changed. And well, so when we started to get into it and I didn't get mad, I just got concerned. And I said, look, you're unhappy. I really want to help you because I want my happy girl back. And I love you and I care about you. Without, rrr, rrr, I finally went off on her a little bit today and then mellowed out and said, no, you're not leaving. Just sit there. I've got your food ready. You don't have to run off and hide. And I backed off and then she was fine. So you don't realize what another thing that you did for you, for you and for her, because she's a female and you're a male, because you uh, no longer get angry and you're able to listen to whatever it is that she's um, sharing with you, whatever emotional expression and communication she's giving to you, you're actually increasing your testosterone, believe it or not, and you're helping her increase her estrogen. Mm. As a male, when you're able to penetrate her energetic field by listening to whatever her emotional diarrhea is that she's having to complain, confess, talk about, air out, without you having to fix it and you just listen, um, that builds your testosterone, but it also increases her estrogen and it also increases her oxytocin because now mm. she's able to, uh, inside of her, the stress then drops, which increases her oxytocin as well. And then any uh, feelings that would normally ensue of depression, which is repressed emotion, um, that dissipates. Um, yeah, because we got like into it Sunday because she told me that when she goes back home, she wants to be committed to a psych ward. She wants to be con Oh. Yeah. And I said, you don't understand the ramifications that that will haunt you the rest of your life. And she goes, at this point, I don't care. I just want help. Okay. She wants help. Okay. So yeah. instead of the psych ward, just, just the help. Wow. Well, she thinks that they'll give her therapy and medication and she's really looking forward to the medication. She wants to numb out. Yeah. She doesn't want to feel, but you know what, with what you know, and you know enough, I mean, uh, Dr. David and all the different uh, hypnotherapists and so forth, they can um, help her without having to, you know, the truth of the matter is uh, anything that a psychedelic, I've never taken psychedelics or anything like that, but I know that like one of the most powerful drugs on the planet is DMT and our pineal gland creates DMT and just by knowing how to breathe in a certain pattern will create dimethyltryptophan that will give you the most mystical far out experiences and you're literally you're detached from your body and it's mm. just by using your breath because your breath is the remote control to your brain and so once you start to understand how to do that then you don't need to uh, you know, use alcohol or drugs or anything else because you can literally detach from your body and have, I don't have drugs to compare it to, so I can't compare it to that, but I can say that the people that I know who have done both and, because mm. I, have, I have one of my friends, for example, he, he's done the actual DMT, I don't know if it's a liquid or a tablet or whatnot, but he's done that through meditation as well as you know, the over, I don't know if that's over the counter or, up, or under the counter, how that works, but um, he says that it's the same, which to me is fascinating. The fact that you don't even have to go reach for something outside. It's already, you know, our body produces over 140,000 chemicals, which upregulate or downregulate our DNA. And, that's and you're the, saying DHT? DMT, dimethyltryptophan. It's one of the chemicals that your pineal gland will produce as you inhale and you exhale, you're alkalizing your body. And as you're, you inhale, you start to put pressure on your pineal gland and you produce like one of the most powerful um, um, like vasopressin, benzodiazepine. 
you know, vasopressin, that's what keeps polar bells, bears sleeping in hibernation for months at a time. Vaso, and people will get vasopressin from psychiatrists, benzodiazepine, um, dimethyltryptophan, DMT, which I don't know if that's over the counter or under the counter or black market. Uh, I, I don't know, but I know that your brain naturally pr produces dimethyltryptophan. And these things are all created through a certain breath pattern. And the only reason I know this is because I study, I've studied with Dr. Joe Dispenza, who's a neuroscientist and um, he, I've been to his monastery. I'm one of his advanced students. And, um, and so we learn about all this, you know, all the neuroendocrinology and the biophysiology and all that kind of stuff. That's and, neat. Yeah. And so you don't, literally through meditation, you can, like, when I got hit by, I got hit, by, I don't know if you were aware, but I got hit by a bus in 2017 while riding my bike. And so I suffered a traumatic brain injury, a neck injury, a back injury, terrible laceration on my, on my right leg, injured both shoulders. It was kind of a mess. Um, but I refuse. I'm like, I know way too many people who've gotten hooked and addicted to pain meds after an accident like that. And I, yeah. I said, there's no freaking way I'm going to get addicted to drugs. Um, and then you're, you know, when you have a traumatic brain injury, you can't think, you can't think, you can't focus, you've got foggy brain, you're like, you're like in la la land for a long time. And so the only thing I could do, I just zoned out by meditating. I mean, uh, I can't even tell you how often I meditated, but I was meditating morning, afternoon and evening because I didn't want to feel the pain in my body. And I couldn't sleep because of the pain in my body. So I was constantly going into meditation because that when I was meditating, I didn't feel anything. And I was literally in a different dimension. Wow. Um, and my body was producing all these extra, you know, it was elevated levels of these different neurochemicals, but I was doing it all just through breath and just oming out. And so I would meditate an hour, two, three at a time um, because I couldn't do, I really couldn't do anything else, but I was not going to, I wouldn't even take aspirin. Oh, but, wow. No, because right now, right now they tell you Tylenol, Advil is fine. And 20, 25 years from now, they're going to say, oh yeah, now this rate, you know, this white paper is saying that it causes, you know, you know, brain tumors, or it causes this type of genetic mutate or whatever. So I'm like, no, so I'm not willing to take anything that's prescribed. <laughs> that's not that I haven't ever, but it's like, I got to be pretty hard pressed to take any kind of prescription. So, um, but yeah, if your daughter, you know, if she really wants to zone out and not feel her body, she used to be real bad a few years ago, just get blazed every night where she couldn't even hardly walk. She fell in the front yard and busted up a sign and was doing weird stuff. What happened to her and found out from her sister, it's like, oh yeah, she was so blazed she can't walk. Yeah, there's, um, there's probably, um, if you look on YouTube, there's all sorts of Dr. Joe testimonials. There's, I remember, I don't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, but there's this one guy I remember. He suffered, he's not very old, he's probably in his 30s, and he had really severe depression, like suicidal type depression. And um, he ended up going to one of Dr. Joe's seven day advanced retreats and went to the monastery and, and so forth. And he was able to be like, all of a sudden he was able to um, heal himself from, from, um, from depression. But that's what you're doing with the meditative practices. You're learning to self heal it, but you have to be the one who, you know, you have to go after it. And part of it is, you know, you learn to master yourself. And, and in doing that, you learn that this is not just self healing. This is how you manifest everything. And so you learn to do it with your eyes open you know, and it doesn't, you don't have to necessarily have your eyes closed. And 
you know, of course that's a little bit more advanced, but it's a process where you little, you just at the beginning, you just do it, not knowing how long it's going to take for it to work for you. Just knowing that it's impossible for it not to work. You just have to do it. And, mm -hmm. and then you start to get results and you're like, Oh, wow. And then little things here, little things there start to, have, some people all of a sudden they have like a big pow. You're like, okay. And it's different for everybody. Um, and some, you know, I've seen people get out of wheelchairs. I've seen people who are blind who now see people who, who were deaf, who now hear, I mean, all sorts of crazy. Wow. Things. Yeah. It's just, it's people who had their back broken in three places, legs. I had a gal, I just interviewed her for my YouTube channel, your Lynn. Um, she fell out of a four story building. Yes. She broke her back and her right leg was shattered. And they were going to amputate her, her, they, first of all, they told her that she wasn't going to survive. She had just lost a baby the week before. This was 10 days before she was supposed to move to South Africa to marry her fiance. She had already shipped her clothes, canceled her insurance and was getting ready to go when she fell out of this four story building. And, um, they, they, the doctors told her that she was going to not make it. And she's like, hell, like I'm not going to make it. I'm going to. I, you know, I'm sure as hell going to make it. They said, well, and we're going to have to amputate your leg because your, your right leg, the bone shattered into a million pieces. So um, we're going to have to amputate that leg. And, and she's like, no, 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 no. You are not amputating anything. They said, well, there's no way you're ever going to walk. Your, your back's broken in three places. She goes, I don't care what, what you're saying. She goes, you are not going to amputate my leg and I will survive this. So they said, you have an 80% chance of dying if we do this surgery. And um, we're gonna vacuum as much as we can out of the bone fragments in your leg, but you're never gonna walk. She said, fine, where do I sign? And I'm not gonna die. And she was already a meditator and she was already familiar with Dr. Joe's. I'll have to send you, I, I'll send you the link to that interview. Mm. It's incredible. She had obviously a very strong will to live and she was already a meditator. So she already was aware of all the people who had been healed of anything and everything you could think of. And so she's like, well, this is now, she went from wanting a mystical experience to now like, now I've got to survive. I got to walk again. I got to do this. And sure enough, this just happened to her November of 2018. So it was just like two years ago. It wasn't that long ago. If you see her now, and you, you'll see her in the Facebook video, not the Facebook video, the um, YouTube video that I did with her, uh, that I interviewed her for my show. You would think this girl's not limping. She looks totally fine. She looks like nothing ever happened to her. Um, you see her on, if you go to her Facebook page, you're like, this happened less than two years ago. This is crazy. She just got married again. Um, so what, that was the next question. What happened to the fiance she was supposed to go see? So she ended up, having a broken body, broken heart, because while she, her fifth day in the hospital in, uh, in the emergency room, her fiance called her to let her know. She's like, oh, because she came out of surgery, so she survived. She's like, babe, I made it, I survived, you know, I'm awake, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, okay, yeah, that's all good. But you know what, um, I don't think this is really gonna work out between you and me. Um, that's it. You and I are over. This is not a good situation for me. Bye. So he broke up with her over the phone like that. Because he didn't want somebody busted up. That's never going to walk. So I'm like, she dodged a bullet. Can you imagine if she would have moved to South Africa and married that asshole? Yeah. So, so now she has a broken heart. She has a broken body. She didn't know it at the time, but fast forward several months, she was like $200,000 in medical debt because of all these surgeries. Yeah. So she had to heal from all of that. Broken heart, broken wallet, broken body, you name it. She was spiritually, psychologically, emotionally just, she wanted to die because it was, it's like anything and everything. Oh, and then she had two daughters from her first marriage. And when her ex who lived in Boston found out that this, you know, that she was potentially going to die, then he was trying to take away those, the two girls from her, because obviously if she's not supposed to, ever, you know, be able to ever walk again. So now he's threatening to take away 
her girls who she clearly could not take care of them because she's in a hospital for who knows how long, right? Right. So it's like everything came crashing down on her. But long hmm. story short, eight weeks after that happened, she was on her feet, standing, and the doctors couldn't believe their eyes. They tested and retested her because she had three centimeters of bone growth. Wow. And they said, this is physically impossible. If your bone was to grow, it would take two or three years for, for three centimeters of bone to grow. And um, what, she, what she did was, as soon as this accident happened, she immediately started. She just basically, all she could do was meditate because her body was so broken and she was in so much pain. And for the first five days, because they didn't know, they, they thought that at any minute they might have to take her as an emergency and put her in surgery, they didn't give her any pain meds. Oh, wow. So she was in horrific pain. And the only way she was able to deal with that was by meditating. And so she did that to the, to the tune where she was able to have her bone grow back three centimeters. And then she ended up having, like the doctors after the first surgery, she survived. They said, we're going to have to do another surgery, but you have an over 80% chance of dying with the first one. You, have, you were under general anesthetics last week when you lost your baby. We're putting you under general anesthetics for this one. You weren't supposed to survive this. We have to do another surgery, but you're probably not going to make it again. And it's very difficult for the body to be put under general anesthetics again. We don't advise it. You probably are not going to survive it. She said, I survived the second surgery. I'll survive. I'll survive the next one. Do it. I, she signed away. And of course, she survived it. And, um, and she just, like I said, she just 24 seven, she couldn't do anything else. She was tied to that hospital bed, literally with a broken body. And wow. so she had to put herself back together in 5d. And she's like, I had no other option. That was my only, she goes, I know, I knew that it worked. It's worked for countless other people who've had all sorts of other, other things. And I had nothing else to do. That was my full-time job, 24 seven. And the rest came to pass. So it's definitely, um, we can all do it. The thing is, hopefully we don't all have to be tested and put through the ringer to that degree of fire. You know, cause uh, some people, they just decide to, this is too hard and they off themselves, they just quit. And, um, they flip, you know, go to the other side, and then others decide, you know what? Um, if there's a possibility, I'm going to do this. There was another guy that uh, had 50 brain tumors. He, he came to Dr. Joe's advanced workshop. His wife had divorced him. He had a 12-year-old daughter. He had 50 brain tumors, and he had yes. yeah, he had eight, I think, eight tumors in his lungs, and I can't remember. He had another organ where he also had tumors. Long story short, doing these specific types of meditations, all completely, all of the tumors gone. Because hmm. uh, you're affecting your, 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 your whole body's chemistry. You're altering everything. And you're not, you're that, learning to- That's not Dr. Who again? That's Dr. Joe Dispenza. If you, um, I'll send you a link, like on my YouTube channel, I do a read, review, and apply of his book, Becoming Supernatural. Uh, where he talks about all these different processes. And then the other book is uh, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Okay. Part of what we're doing is we're breaking the habit of being the personality that we've created to deal and cope with life as we know it. And you can basically, you can create your own personal reality by recreating your personality to the one that you choose as opposed to having the personality that is the one that you have by default because of your life circumstances, whatever you've been conditioned to through your society, how you grew up, your teachers, your neighborhood, your friends, your family, your neighbor, etc. Now, instead of by default, you can do it by design on purpose and you completely change who you are from the inside out and everything from health, psychology, emotional, spiritual well-being, you recreate an entire way of being. 
Hmm. So, so how did you find out about him? I first learned about Dr. Joe about 10 or 12 years ago when there was a movie called What the Bleep. Mm -hmm. And he was in that movie, What the Bleep. And so I was fascinated. I got the unabridged, you know, six hour version of that movie because I've always been into, you know, uh, health and well-being and medical sciences and all that. And then, um, and then uh, when I got hit by the bus in 2017, yeah, that was kind of a game changer uh, for me because I was in, you know, I was, it was one month um, before my divorce was final. It's like, what terrible, finally, I'm going to be free of this marriage. And now a month before I actually get my final divorce papers, I can't believe I get, of all the things in the world, I get hit by a freaking bus while <laughs> riding my freaking bike. So that, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like, I finally am thinking I'm like done and over with all this crap and now this. So now I'm having to heal from, from that. So that's what led me to get his book, Becoming Supernatural, because I started to see that in his videos, he was starting to have, um, it was like biblical proportions of people that were having spontaneous healings at his live events. So he went from having here and there to all of a sudden, it was like a critical mass. And I thought, now you've got my attention because now I see that you have something that you can repeat over and over again and you can you can predict the outcome because it's not just it doesn't matter where doesn't matter if the person's never meditated or meditated for 20 30 years doesn't matter if they're fluent in english or not doesn't matter what country what religion doesn't matter if they're young it doesn't matter if they're old tall short fat skinny in a wheelchair out of a wheelchair if you do it you can be healed whether it's physical emotional abuse some trauma um physical you know your body is broken from some sort of accident because his story was he also got hit by a truck when he was in a triathlon he was on his bike wow he broke his back and he was told he was never going to walk again he had a medical practice at the time and he still does and um so he he's one of those where he was never supposed to be able to ever walk again. And all the neurologists and all the spine specialists told him, you're never going to walk again. And we recommend that you get that Harrington rod surgery where you put a titanium rod in your spine so that you can hold up your head because, you, you, you know, your back is broken so badly that your head's too heavy for your spine. So you need to put a rod to support your head. So you're going to be a quad, you know, quadriplegic. Well, and he had been meditating since he was in college and he's like, you know what, there's got to be a better way because he knows what the ramifications and what the outcome is of having that, you know, because he was a chiropractor at the time. So long story short, 10 weeks after his accident, he was back on his feet and the doctors couldn't believe it. But he was, you know, he talks about, you know, in the book, Becoming Supernatural. And if you listen to his YouTube videos, you'll hear about how, you know, he really, that monkey mind is, it's a bitch. And so he had to go over and over and over again, because the hardest thing for people, for all of us, for everybody, you know, managing your ego, your brain, distinguishing the true you versus your ego and the function of the ego versus your brain and the memories that it stores, as opposed to the physical emotions that it stores in your body and distinguishing and knowing that they're not all, they're not all you, you think that you're, they're all you. And then how you have to manage that energy and how that thought process works and how you stay and who you truly are and don't believe the bullshit that your ego and your brain's memories and the feelings that you get in your body, especially the stored negative energy in your body, the negative feelings in your body and emotions, those can get, feel really bad and you think that that's you, but it's not you. So once you get that crystal clear, then every time, then you can command your ego and your brain to shut up. And you're like, wait a minute, you've been yeah. master all this time because I didn't even know that I had the choice of, I thought you were me, come to find out you're not me. So ego, 
You are the servant. You're no longer the master. You are the servant. You're in timeout. Brain, you're not the master anymore either. So you now do as I say. And body, you're my servant too. You do as I say. No, uh, you're getting shaking like I was up doing a challenge course during the, I didn't know that there was going to be any kind of a challenge course during the seven day event at his monastery. Who knows if that would have changed my mind about going, but I didn't know. So next thing I know, we have to walk on this I-beam that's 50 feet up in the air and it's only three inches wide. So it's like the width of my shoe. And I'm afraid of heights or I was afraid of heights. So as I'm going up, even the stairs, they're not even a little bit, you know, leaning on the, you know, the two by two to get up there. It's like straight up. So you, if you, it's like, you have to hold on for dear life just to get on top. So as I'm climbing up, I'm having, having to tell my brain and my ego, no, because I'm thinking, are you crazy? You can't go all, it's like 50 freaking feet up in the air. Are you nuts? You're going to fall off that thing. You're going to go splat. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I? Nope. I couldn't allow that monkey mind chatter. He had already prepped us. It was all, of course, I, as luck would have it, I'm in the first group that goes up. So I didn't have the benefit of hearing all these other people. So, so just with 12, about 12, 14 hours of training, I had to quickly identify my ego, my brain, and my body and separate that and go, no, ego, shut up brain do as i say body so as i went up i'm telling myself i can do this i can do this it's like you're crazy you can't do this nope yes you can i can do this i can do this i'm doing this i'm doing this so once i'm up there all of a sudden my legs i'm thinking i'm in control i'm taking deep breaths i'm slowing down my heart rate i'm slowing down my breath i'm slowing down my brain waves i'm gonna do an opened eye walking meditation I'm telling myself I've got good balance. I've, I'm going to be steady, Eddie. I'm not going to take the next step until I have my foot firmly planted on the next. I'm totally brainwashing myself. And then my <laughs> legs start to shake uncontrollably. But I'm not, I don't feel like I'm afraid because I'm totally in this laser focus. I don't even see how high. I don't hear any of the music. I don't hear anybody talking. I'm like in this tunnel and then my legs start to shake. It's like my body's betraying me and I'm going, wait a minute. What are you guys doing? What are you doing shaking? I'm like, yeah, I didn't give it. I didn't give you permission to shake. I'm like, I can't be wasting energy with shaking legs. It's impossible for me to get across from this side to the other side. If my legs are shaking, there's no way I'll be able to be steady. So I told my body, I said, body, stop shaking my legs. Brain, do as I say. Ego, shut up. You're in timeout. Laser focus, <laughs> all the cells in my body. I commanded them. I said, we are focused like a laser. We are looking at this eye beam, that yellow strip. We go, the goal is to get from this side to the other side. End of story. I don't know how, but my legs stopped shaking. I assumed that the moment I said it, that it would be so. Luckily, it was. And then I just somehow made it across to the other side. And I'm like, I didn't lose my balance. There's more to that story. I won't bore you with the details. I actually did a video on that. But that experience taught me so much because I ended up referring back to that over and over and over again. I had all... 2019, especially as I travel, traveled throughout different parts of the world, I kept on having, un, I call them unwanted situations that would present themselves. And I kept on going back to that experience. It's like ego, time out. Ego, hmm. you're not my amigo, you're my enemigo, you're in time out. Brain, you're my servant, do as I say. Body, you are my servant, do as I say. I'm commanding the brain. The brain's not commanding me. So I'm using my focus, my conscious awareness. I'm using my free will to take that focus and command my autonomic nervous system to do as I say now. And then I assumed, 
when I gave the command that it would be so, and it was. Well, good. So I think, I think, uh, I know that it'll help your daughter. Um, uh, if you want to check out, I, I did do a read, review, and apply, uh, like I said, of that book, Becoming Supernatural, on my YouTube channel, because there's there are certain shortcuts that had I known these certain things when I was going through this, um, it would have gotten me results faster. So that's part of what I do when we're doing the read, the review, and apply of that particular book. Hmm. to help you expedite so you get results faster. But the ultimate is to go to one of his events. Holy cow. It really is um, life-changing. Well, I looked on him while we were talking and then went and found all these e-books of his. So the, the, when you're hearing the ding 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 it's me downloading the books. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, becoming supernatural, breaking the habit of being yourself. Um, you are the placebo. I started off with becoming supernatural, but you read those books and holy cow. Yeah, intermission boxes. Oh, that's a meditation box book. lecture, breaking the habit. Yeah. Rewired. Yeah, rewired. Rewired is on um, Gaia. You can watch the Rewired series, phenomenal series. Mm. It really is fantastic. And then watch testimonials on YouTube. When you watch testimonial after testimonial, it's really quite remarkable. All you know, right. There's a lot of, I mean, I love the fact he gives you all the science all the neuroscience behind it so that you actually understand. When you go to his live events, he actually will show you an x-ray of somebody. You see like when you're inhaling, you actually see the cerebral spinal fluid in the spinal column going up. And wow. um, you will actually see, normally your cerebral spinal fluid cycles twice in a 24 hour period. But when you do a deep inhale, hold and exhale, your cerebral spinal fluid, as you tense in the muscles, as you bring your attention up, it pushes your cerebral spinal fluid to go up, coats the top of your brain and releases in that one breath cycle. So let's say you do 10 breaths during a meditation. Now you have 12 cycles of your cerebral spinal fluid and the salts and the electrolytes hitting your pineal gland, which puts pressure on your pineal gland that creates something called the piezoelectric effect. It mm -hmm. starts the, it's the beginning of you starting to create dimethyltryptophan because you have like these five little crystals that are on the top of your pineal gland. And as the faster you get your cerebral spinal fluids circulating by doing these breaths in a certain way, these little five crystals start to shimmy. And as they shimmer faster and faster together, it um, creates an electrical reaction, which is what sets off a chemical reaction of the benzodiazepine, mm -hmm. dimethyltryptophan, vasopressin, oxytocin, serotonin, melatonin, yada, yada. And that's what starts to now signal your autonomic nervous system. And that's when you have, when you have an intention and a vision of what it is that you want to heal, then it upregulates or downregulates whatever your genes are, where you can actually physically, he actually tests. So people who come to the, you have a thousand people at a time. So he'll take 50 people or a hundred people and they'll actually put, um, have them hooked up to EEGs for their heart. They'll have um, brain monitors where they have neuroscientists that are actually monitoring their brain waves, taking IgA immunoglobulin levels. They're taking DNA samples of people, they can see that the telomere lengths in the DNA is actually, they say that it's impossible for telomere length to grow. Well, hello, they actually have, three medical schools actually have all this data right now, where you can see that IgA levels go up, telomere lengths grow in just three, four days, not weeks, months, or years. And so you have all this hard conclusive data, which modern medicine says it's impossible, but you have all these, doctors and scientists from all over the world who are there testing the people in real time, looking at the results going, how is this going on? This is crazy. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. 
It's neat. Yeah. Well, I think we should probably end it here for now. We're on page 66. We can continue on uh, next, next time with page 66. Okay. From here. Do you have any questions about any of uh, those uh, things that you're learning about? You know, as you read Dr. Joe, feel free to reach out. But I think it would be awesome if we could, if, if you could do a hypnosis on me and vice versa, check out the thing about my, I would love to get rid of these glasses, those awesome fit wearing my glasses. Okay. That would be awesome. So, sounds good? Sounds good. Pam texted a little while ago, what you doing? And I said I was with you, and she said, tell you hi. Will do. I got to give her a call. I love that girl. She's so awesome. I know that feeling. She is. She's amazing. She's amazing. I love when you coined that amazing. She is amazing. She is. Well, I guess we lost George Boscovich. I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name. Boscovich, I think. But it doesn't look like he was able to come back on. But uh, anyhow, it's good seeing you again. Yeah. Yeah, I missed you at the last one. Um, oh, the, the last one of these? Well, no, no. Um, when you were in town a couple of weeks ago. I, I didn't realize till afterwards. I know, I think we talked or texted over the phone, and I was going to tell you about maybe meeting for dinner, and I didn't realize it till afterwards. I'm like, oh, I forgot to call Chet. And it was like, that was a much more... Um, it was like we were so wiped out after each class not one evening did we you know how in august how we were out able to practice every night mm -hmm. we were too exhausted after yeah because christina said it's just brain overload it was i think our bodies were processing so much from all the you know because you know we're being regressed back to the not just back to the womb but regressed to the point where prior to you being in the womb, to where you're like a blue spark before you were even even in the womb. Oh, preconception. Yeah, preconception when you were a blue spark. So oh, wow. prior to conception. So I think there was so much. I don't think we realized um, how much we were processing um, until, and then the days would go. It's like we would blink, and it was like, oh my gosh, it's six, seven o'clock at, at night again, and then. Once it was done, oh, then it's like have dinner, and then really everybody's like wiped out. And like a couple times, I said I'd like to try, but I'm like, no, not really. I just want to go to my room, and I just want to return whatever phone calls, voicemails, text messages. And yeah, because that was the way Christina acted. Like I'm too wiped to even come home, so she crashed with Jonathan most of the time. And yeah, then, it was. It was. It was. Yeah, it was different. I mean, I didn't expect it to be, and I never get tired, but I definitely, I mean, for me to be, I told Dr. Snyder, I'm like, yeah, one time I was in bed under the covers at 10 o'clock at night. That, wow. that never happens even, I mean, I don't normally ever get sick, but once in a blue moon, whenever I am sick, maybe I'll be in bed before, before midnight. So under the covers at 10 with Amazon Prime or YouTube, just watching on my Kindle. Uh, I was just tuckered out where I just wanted to veg. So, That's kind of the way she was. Because yeah. we were down there that last night trying to catch up with you or anybody after the whole thing was over. And she was having car problems, so I came and rescued her. Oh, that's nice. And that's took, took care of that. And then we went and found the group at uh you know, no i can't remember whatever the restaurant was and they were hanging back in the the one room bullwinkles yeah or bailiwick yeah and it was interesting because went in there and tj's at one end and snyder's at the other and then there was paul and heidi and on the other side was stephanie and um allegra yeah and Holly. And we just kind of walked in and said hi and everything. And I said, hey, I just got through watching somebody that looked just like you called David Van Ark. And, <laughs> he's, sitting, 
he's sitting kicked back in his chair like this, and all of a sudden he goes, oh, I don't believe that guy. He's a poser. He's just an asshole. He doesn't even have good vests. And I just kind of looked at him and went, whoa, I think somebody's been drinking. His whole personality changed. Really? Yeah. Stephanie was all, hi, how you guys doing? How you been? And Allegra just kind of sit there going, mm. Paul said a few things. She went in to see TJ and talked to him for a few. And then they teased um, Heidi about the cherry chocolates, again, or strawberry covered. Strawberry. Covered yeah. strawberries. And, but it was curse. weird. But it's, you know, it's like, okay, who I saw for, 10 days in class and everything else, that wasn't him. Because he, he was drinking. It sounds like you caught him like pretty inebriated, it sounds like. Yeah, but it was like, well, no offense, but you're an ass. <laughs> <laughs> the, way, the way he was acting where everybody else was fine. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. And I just kind of went, Hmm, different side of you. But yeah. it was like, oh yeah, it's all over. Now I can go party. Wow. And he was, just the way he was talking about himself, it was like, oh, don't believe that guy. Blah, 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 blah. Because he came out, are you familiar with David Van Ark? Yeah, isn't that the guy who used for the sexual persuasion, whatever? That's him. Yeah, but that's isn't that the name when he was when he was doing seduction videos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah that's yeah. the name he used for any of the sexual persuasion or whatever. Yeah, like on the videos, he he hired a couple of hookers and he's shown what to do and how yeah, to yeah, do yeah. it and everything else. And I laugh, but and normally he would have just gone, oh, yeah. but the way he did it and everything else was just kind of like, whoa. Maybe he was drinking a lot. I mean, I've never seen him. I saw him drinking a little bit because we went yeah, out. Yeah, drinking a little bit. I'm thinking, all right, the whole thing's over. We're done. We get to pack up. And it didn't look like it, but they'll come along, take the glasses. But he looked like, you know, the way he was acting was like, oh, yeah, you've been drinking. And I know that TJ had because uh, Christina had been talking to him. Oh. But he acted fine. Paul said a few things. But you know, just the way, like I said, he's kicked back in the chair. And, uh, but, uh, <laughs> I wasn't slurring his words or anything, but just the action. I was like, taken wow. back by. Interesting. Like, yeah, like, yeah, interesting. But, and even Christina said something about it. I'm sure. Uh, and, I talked to her. She goes, yeah, that was weird. And the way he was acting and everything else. So, yeah, oh, well. Sounds like a little bit of his dark side kind of surfaced with the alcohol. Yeah. Who knows? Well, he, he admits he's got that side, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. But some of us, yeah, don't we all? Yeah. But anyway, thanks. And it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. So, well, it's good seeing you again. Yep. All righty. We well, have a good night, and we'll I'll put on uh, identity by design. Um, whenever we do the next one, it'll be probably next Tuesday, and um, and then I'll okay. send you. Like I said, uh, if you want, I'll send you for the YouTube channel so that you see you can start reading and listening to um, Becoming Supernatural. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. Take care. All right. Bye.